Hi folks! As an update, my laptop data was recoverable and I have the illustrations for Civil Rights Part 2 again. Whew. Of course, now I have to continue with the rest of the video which will still take a while. Massive thank you to everyone who is supporting me on Patreon. It really helps me to keep this work going. If you would like to support me on Patreon, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash John D. Ruddy. And now, John talks about a united Ireland. So, this topic has been popping up more and more in Irish discourse, particularly since the Brexit vote. I'll be honest, before Brexit, I wasn't much of a proponent of a united Ireland. Most people, either side of the border, seemed to be happy with the status quo. Anyone who considered themselves Irish felt Irish, those who considered themselves British felt British. The Good Friday Agreement and the Invisible Border allowed Northern Ireland to enjoy a relatively peaceful couple of decades. I say relatively, it wasn't perfect. As many of you know, I live in the Republic of Ireland, south of the border. Although technically northwest of the border, being in Donegal, but I'll not, I'll, I'll, I'll not go there. I can literally see Northern Ireland from my house. I can see Russia from my house. I figured as long as the status quo remained predominantly peaceful, with a younger generation looking to move beyond the identity politics and dark times of the past, a united Ireland may have been more hassle than it's worth. Brexit changed all of this. I spoke about the Northern Ireland border and a bit about Brexit in another video, but this situation continues to change. With the action of the UK leaving the European Union against the popular will of the people of Northern Ireland, it once again threw up many questions about Northern Ireland. The Good Friday Agreement was coming into question, this agreement upon which most of Northern Ireland's peace is built. But before we look to the future, let's look to the past and ask, was Ireland ever actually united? Not really, kinda, sort of, ish. So Ireland is interesting being an island nation, so its coastal border hasn't really changed in human history. Other countries have grown and shrunk. Some countries disappeared off the map completely. Some re-emerged. Mountain ranges often give fairly lasting boundaries, such as the border between France and Spain. But the shape of the island of Ireland is just all there and that's what Ireland is. There's bits of Germany that were once France, half of Eastern Europe was once Russia, but Ireland is Ireland. But has it been united? Well, it's always been various kingdoms struggling against each other for power, provinces often having their own kings or chieftains. Sometimes there were high kings of Ireland, but it's questionable how much their power extended across the whole island. The slow and steady English conquest of Ireland continued a divided map of Ireland. In the 1640s, an Irish Catholic Confederacy was declared in Ireland, but the newly planted and recently massacred Protestant planters from Scotland and England, they didn't really come under that Confederacy, did they? In the 1790s, the United Irishmen fought to create an Irish Republic, aimed at being a more intellectual, secular republic, like the recently established United States of America. America was, and technically still is, secular. The United Irishmen, of course, were defeated, and in response, Ireland was brought into the Union, directly becoming the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. And it's here that, technically, Ireland was united. <laughs> it was united under the bigger banner of the United Kingdom, but it was still technically united. Technicality. Of course, the people politically remained divided. It's interesting because it was around the 1790s that a lot of the Ulster Unionist loyalist identity really began to solidify. 
The United Irishmen proposing an Irish Republic were mainly Protestant. The penal laws brought in after Oliver Cromwell and the Williamite War clamped down on Catholic and Presbyterian rights, effectively helping to unite many Catholics and Presbyterians against the British. Many Anglicans in Ireland too saw the value in an Irish Republic. The British establishment helped to stoke religious fear, particularly in Ulster, between Catholics and Protestants. Good old divide and conquer. It was around this time that the Orange Order was set up, further giving Ulster Protestants a banner of identity to march behind. Literally. This suited Britain in the 1790s, but a century later, as Ireland wanted home rule, and Britain was considering that it could be a welcome change to give the Paddies their own wee parliament again to squabble about their own wee Paddy problems over in Paddyland. But of course, you know, still within the United Kingdom, of course, but just, you know, over there in the other part of the kingdom. The Ulster Unionists, of course, threw a complete spanner in the works. Most of Ireland's industry was in Ulster, and they believed a parliament in Dublin would be run by the Catholic Church. And in hindsight, they weren't wrong. Of course, maybe if they had stayed and engaged in a parliament in Dublin, then they would have been able to balance the power a little bit more. But And yes, there were Unionists in the South too, particularly South Dublin. Edward Carson, the great hero of the Ulster Covenant, was a dub. The Ulster Unionists kicked up such a fuss that, long story short, one world war and an Irish war of rebellion later, the British chose to divide Ireland into North and South, with a parliament in Dublin and a parliament in Belfast. Northern Ireland became a Protestant state for a Protestant people, despite the sizeable Catholic population. At the beginning of Northern Ireland, there was about one third Catholic, two thirds Protestant. In the 1960s, people marched for Catholic civil rights, and unfortunately, as we all know, this sadly deteriorated into the Troubles. Decades of terrorism and murder ended with the Good Friday Agreement, stating that if the majority of people of Northern Ireland wish to join the rest of Ireland, the British government will allow the change. They're not going to fight for it. Which is more than can be said about the Falklands. I mean... That's the history. You've heard a lot of that from me before. But what about now? So, before we continue, let's look a little at the language I'll be using. Unionists are pro-Britain, pro-Union with Britain. Loyalists are loyal to Britain. That term tends to apply more to the extreme violence-prone end of Unionists. So like, you know, when you hear like a loyalist group, you know, there tends to be a paramilitary element to it. Not always, but mm, tends to be. Nationalists are Irish nationalists who consider themselves Irish and probably support a united Ireland. Probably, but not necessarily. Since the peace process, there has been a bit of an underlying existential crisis with Ulster Unionists. Unionists are like the ultimate fanboys and fangirls of Britain, who are all in on Britishness. And yet, when they go to England, most people see them as Irish. So, you're Irish? No, we're British. But you're from Ireland? We're from Northern Ireland. Yeah, so you're Irish. I do not mean to disrespect Unionists. I feel they've been dealt a bad hand in sorts, in being the cousin Oliver of the UK, not really fitting in anywhere. There's some wonderful literature from the early 20th century from the old Anglo-Irish writers, uh, such as like Elizabeth Bowen, exploring that idea of identity, of being Protestant and descended from the old English, but having lived and breathed Ireland, feeling awkwardly neither fully Irish nor fully British. Graham Norton speaks about this today, about having grown up a Protestant in Cork. Northern Ireland, of course, is a bit different, though, with a much more sizable and often majority Protestant communities. In the North, since the Troubles, as nationalists have made more progress in power sharing, many Unionists feel like their way of life is being eroded, their rights are being eroded. And that sense sometimes happens when a disadvantaged group begins to gain 
equal rights. They're beginning to get the same as you, not more. An incident that comes to mind is from back in 2013 when there were very angry crowds of loyalists who were very upset that Belfast City Council had decided that the British Union flag would no longer be flown every day above Belfast City Hall and only on special days, bringing it in line with the other public building protocols across the United Kingdom. I understand this. I understand the sense of erosion, but it's a move towards a city and indeed a country that isn't just for unionists. If you were the only people living there, that's one thing, but you're not. It is a land we share. We share our space with many, many different people. I think these knee-jerk reactions often can be a recognition of the inevitability of change. Belfast City Council voting to no longer fly the Union flag every day is an indication that the Unionists are no longer the dominant power, or at least no longer the only dominant power. And seeing that their time to make all of the decisions is at an end. Which, yeah, you can understand why that could be frustrating, but at the same time, when other people are not being heard, there's a problem. The Troubles moves further and further into the past. I barely remember much of it. I remember news reports of bombings. I remember graffiti of IRA spray painted on walls. I remember the Oma bombing specifically. I vaguely remember the British Army checkpoints on the border as we went into Derry to get the Christmas shopping. And again, I grew up in the Republic, so I do have a different experience of this than someone growing up in Northern Ireland. But still, more and more young people my age and younger yes i still count myself as a young person <laughs> grow up and grow up in northern ireland not at war a northern ireland proud of how it has come out of the other side of a very dark time to a brighter tomorrow that sounds really cheesy but still seriously though like northern ireland has been through so much and it is such a wonderful, vibrant place that is so proud of itself in a really good way. Northern Ireland is a really cool place. It's class. Belfast's so cool. Derry's a great city. Like the, oh, the, the landscapes, the giant's causeway. That's where they shot Game of Thrones. The history, the writing, the culture. And no, this was not paid for by Northern Ireland tourism. But if you would like to sponsor me, get in touch at johndruddy.com. So, a united Ireland. What would happen to Ulster Unionists in a united Ireland? I mean, the obvious answer is they would continue to exist and live and breathe in Ulster, the land their people have called home for 400 years. It is their home. It is understandable that a Unionist would find living in a United Ireland difficult. When one's entire political identity is centred on the Union with Britain, with Britishness, no longer having that Union would be a massive upheaval. And indeed, it's the kind of thing where they know there's no take back seats. Like, they'll remain British for as long as they hold on to it, but once that tie is severed, it's not likely to come back. A united Ireland is kind of the worst case scenario for many unionists. But what happened to the unionists in the south? What did South Dublin do after Irish independence? Well, many joined what would become Fine Gael and got back into participating in politics. I mean, they didn't all join Fine Gael, but a lot of them did, which would explain a lot. <laughs> They recognised they needed to move on and participate in the project before them, or risk be left behind. There are still plenty of people in Ireland who quietly consider if Ireland should rejoin the United Kingdom, but that idea is often shot down fairly quickly. Of course, I understand the much more sizable Unionist population of Ulster 
is different from the pockets of unionism in the south. But in the event of a united Ireland, participation is a must to have your voice heard. Like, I'm not saying that unionists aren't going to get involved in politics. Of course they are. But, you know, this is just the thing. Like, there are those practical things that just kind of need to, that will continue. I think a united Ireland could actually fix a lot of politics in Ireland, north and south. Hopefully it could help end the identity politics of the North with political parties standing for policies and not just this flag or that flag. It could create a seismic shift in Irish politics, completely rearranging political parties. Like, for example, the particularly conservative corners of Fianna Fáil could find some surprising political allies in the conservatism of the DUP. It could hopefully help create a proper left and right in Irish politics and not this false choice of Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael. Wow, they're so different. Look at them. They're such different political parties. Wow. For anyone who doesn't know Irish politics, it's like Metallica and Megadeth. They're so different. I mean, they are, but like... They're, they're very similar and, and they both have shared roots. Two sides of the same coin. It's like Kang and Kodos. Some parties might want to merge or form grand coalitions. Who's to know? But I'd be intrigued to see the first general election post-United Ireland. Plus, there would be proportional representation in the North. Sadly, there is, of course, the potential for violence. There is still underground paramilitary activity and some loyalists may indeed be deeply upset about living in a united Ireland. Again, understandable. Not necessarily excusable, but understandable. My Irish nationalists had the same difficulty living in Northern Ireland under a British flag. You know, it's, it's, it's understandable. I think it could actually require a, a UN peacekeeping mission for a decade or so to allow the new normal to settle in. As I said before, at that stage, the Loyalists wouldn't really have a goal to achieve. The British ship would have sailed at that point. I think how Unionists are treated in a united Ireland is very important. We can't have this triumphalist attitude of, ha ha, you're not British anymore. Like, gloating never solved anything. If they want to celebrate their British identity, go for it. Wave your crimson banner high. Let's, let's make the 12th of July a national holiday across the whole country. Why not? Have the Orange Order go down to Drogheda and march on the actual site of the Battle of the Boyne. Like, why not? Of course, just leave the misplaced bigotry and burning of effigies at the door. Celebrate your culture, just not at the expense of other cultures. We have an opportunity to become a much stronger island nation. The Irish tricolour, first unveiled in 1848, represents peace between Catholics and Protestants. It was created for the whole island. Of course, to many people, that flag has since absorbed new meanings. One of which being Brits out. So if you identify as British, then it's not a very inviting flag. It would certainly be worth exploring the possibility of a new flag for a united Ireland, representing the diverse population of the entire island. But here's the thing, we talk so much about symbolism and flags and grand gestures, but practically, there's a lot that people often forget about. Like, the BBC, what's going to happen there? Is the BBC going to hang around? Is Radio Foil and Radio Ulster and BBC Northern Ireland, are they, you know, what's going to happen there? There are so many subsidies from Britain that do help Northern Ireland run. There's a lot of a lot of state-run jobs in Northern Ireland, state-paid jobs in Northern Ireland, which 
the Irish government will then have to fit the bill. So there's a lot. You know, the, the Royal Mail will have to become an post. Signposts becoming bilingual and indeed in kilometers as the UK still uses miles. I, for one, really look forward to the prospect of bilingual signs as there is so much to be learned from the original Irish place names of Ulster. But still, like there, like there are so many. It's something that could not happen overnight. It's a long process. It's a very complicated process. A lot of systems changing hands. You know, can we afford it though? The people of Northern Ireland will no longer have the NHS or free school books. There is going to be a cost to this. But the question is, will it improve the lives of people on the island in the long run? They get European Union membership back. If Brexit has shown us anything, detaching oneself from a union without proper preparation is like trying to pull out a games console from underneath the TV while it's still plugged into half of the sitting room. When voting on this, the people need to know what they're getting, and indeed, perhaps, what they're losing. An informed choice. An informed decision. There is give and take in compromise. This year is the 100th anniversary of the creation of Northern Ireland. I'm intrigued to see how long it may last. Will the UK last? With Scotland eyeing up another independence referendum? Who's to know? Whatever happens, as always, I hope that it happens peacefully. As always, folks, thanks for watching. Let me know what you think in the comments. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. I'm finally back working on the Civil Rights Part 2 now that I have my data recovered. Be sure to hit the bell icon to know as soon as I post it. Shout out to KS Computers of Remelton for saving the day. If you wish to support the making of these videos, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash John D. Ruddy. Don't forget to visit johndruddy.com for a ton of Manny Man merchandise, including Irish history timeline posters, Irish history coloring books, US presidents posters, Irish history books, and much, much more. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Twitch. I'm going to start live streaming some of my artwork from the new Manny Man videos, so that'll be fun. Welcome to our new supporter, Talitha Brower. Thanks to all my patrons. Alexander, Arthur Revan, Chair DJ, Colton Sayre, David Strenad, Emer Gibson, Sennon, age 10, Gretchen Sand, Helena RB, Jefferson Yates, Joshua Benjamin Heisler, Judy Friesen, Cafort, Catherine Gilks, Caithias, La Prechee Quinvara, Marcus Booker, Matt, Mike Wise, Monday Rico, Mr. Magnificent, Mr. Research, Classy Black Men, Mr. Easy Play 2, Mycroft, Myth Nguyen, Ollie Course, Patrick McGrath, Rocket Wrench, Ryan Ilano, Serena Kajani, SB, Suarez, Stephanie Lenz, Tan May, Thomas Woods, Travis Dunn. Once again, thank you.